All right, I want to welcome everybody at our 288 campus, our Friendswood campus, our Alvin campus, our Webster campus, our Pearland campus, our online campus, and everybody at the Weibo Bible Church in Weibo, Montana. If you're brand new with us, we are walking through the letter in the Bible of 1 Peter in a series that we're calling different, and we're calling it different because we as Christians are called to be different. As followers of Jesus Christ in a world gone mad where things are kind of upside down right now, you know, right is wrong, wrong is right, and, and uh, people are crazy, and the world is nuts, right? And, and we, we are called to be different. We're called to be set apart. <clears throat> we talked about this, I don't know, two or three weeks ago, where we're called to be set apart, but not set apart like in a commune out in the hill country where we're all going to live together forever and ever. No, nope, nope. Not to be set apart there. Some of you are like, that would be pretty nice. No, no, that would not be pretty nice. Not set apart like that, but set apart in the way that we live, if, in the way that we live. So if you want to follow along in your Bible, we're going to be here. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 22. And today I just want to talk to you about being a good representative for Jesus. Now, <clears throat> you may notice if you have been following along that uh, we're skipping verses one through seven. We're skipping verses one through seven, at least for the moment. That's because those verses are about, uh, about marriage and <clears throat> specifically about women. And I just want you to know I'm not skipping them because I'm afraid. That's not why I'm skipping them. <laughs> um, I'm skipping them because we're having a series on marriage, maybe in January, still trying to get things on the calendar. But... Um, we're going to save those verses until that series. So you might say, I'm saving those verses for marriage, so to speak, all right? So uh, we're going to begin at verse 8 today. And as we get into the passage, I want you to keep in mind that uh, the Christians in the early church didn't have a lot of the things that are uh, present nowadays. They did not have uh, social media bumper stickers. They did not have uh, Christian t-shirts. They didn't have celebrity pastors on Instagram. They didn't have Bible apps. They didn't even have church buildings. Yet amazingly, we're told again and again in the book of Acts that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So how did they get to this? How did this even happen without them having a billboard or a, a commercial on TV or a podcast or a Facebook page? How, how did this kind of happen right here uh, in their lives and in the church? Well, uh, they did it with the same, same kind of advertising that works best still to this day, and that would be the testimony of a satisfied customer. How many of you, if you are ever buying something on Amazon, uh, go here first? You know what here is right here? That's the reviews. And that, you know, there's the stars. How many stars did it get? And let's read some of the reviews. And I go there every single time before I hit in car, put it in car. You know, I, I go here and I read some reviews and so forth because to me that's gold. Even though now I've heard that some companies pay people to sit at their computers all day long and give five stars and reviews in broken English. But I still... <laughs> For the moment, for the moment, I still go here. I consider this gold, right? And, 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 and by the way, if you're wondering uh, why there's a snowman on the screen today, um, uh, it's because my wife sent me a link um, with a family of four snowmen that she wanted for the yard, and, and, but it was $175, $180, right? And, and so I found one that was $26.99, and so that's... <laughs> That's why this is here right now, and uh, so far, nothing's in the cart at this point. I'll just <laughs> update you, but, and by the way, since a, a snowman is on the screen, uh, let's talk about Christmas for just a second. Our Christmas series is going to begin the week after Thanksgiving, so Thanksgiving's on Thursday, as always. That next weekend is going to be the beginning of our Christmas series. This year, I'm calling it Down to Earth Christmas, Down to Earth Christmas, and it's kind of a play on words, so to speak, double meaning, because Jesus came down to earth at Christmas time, right? But also, I just want to keep our Christmas down to earth this year. And so we're going to keep it simple at our church. We're going to sing more singable Christmas songs. We're going to keep it low key. 
and, and it's gonna, um, we're going to transfer this to, to the church, hopefully, and I'm going to give you ways from Scripture to kind of uh, bring Christmas down to earth in your family as well. And, and I just want I, I to say one out loud right now, even though I'm not supposed to be preaching a Christmas sermon yet, but if I wait to, to tell you all this, it's going to be too late. So I'm going to tell you now. Don't overspend this Christmas. Don't overspend. Keep it down. We got some applause in the room. Some applause. How about that? <clears throat> Keep it down to earth. Make a budget and stick with it, okay? Don't go in debt. Don't go in debt for Christmas, man. The debt's going to last till next Christmas. Don't do it. Instead of, instead of giving, and tell your family, it's just going to be a little different this year. And, and, and instead of giving lots of presents, work on it to make memories and give presents, give your presents, get people together and make memories together. I'm just going to throw out one idea just because I'm talking about it already. <laughs> but you have to make sure the burn ban has been lifted before you do this. Um, on, on one of the uh, cold, crisp evenings in in December that we all hope for, cold, crisp evenings in December that hopefully we'll have. Um, uh, start a little campfire in the backyard, put lawn chairs around it, get some sticks, cook some marshmallows with your extended family and make some s'mores. And as you're cooking and talking, how, how about this? How about going around the, the circle and just having people tell what their favorite Christmas was or what their favorite part of Christmas is and get everybody talking. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. You're going to make memories, memories that are going to outlast any present that anybody in the room could get, you know? So, all right, I get a quick preaching about Christmas now. Uh, but down to earth, down to earth, Christmas is coming after uh, Thanksgiving. So back to this, back to the reviews. Reviews are important. Uh, the biggest selling point for some things. Same is true for our faith. Now, we've learned a few times in our series through this letter that we are representing Jesus. And so, if people are wondering, is Jesus worth it? Is, is Jesus real? Can Jesus really change somebody's life? Can, can following Jesus really be helpful? Can it make a difference in somebody's life? The closest thing that people have to seeing Jesus and Jesus' work is to look at our lives. See, think about that. If a person was to rank Jesus based on what they have seen of him in our life, how many stars would they give Jesus? Now, obviously, that's a hypothetical question with many variables, including that person's bias for or against Jesus in the first place. But still, Peter, in the text here, is... is showing us some ways that we can represent Jesus well in our lives. And here they are, beginning with number one, then we'll get to the text. We represent Jesus best when we just do the right thing, when we do the right thing. Now, if this sounds like a recurring theme that's been in this series, it's because it's a recurring theme in this letter. Um, he, Peter talks about it again and again, that we are proof of God's work. Our lives are the product that people see. So are we a good endorsement for Jesus? I had a friend years ago who was going to start a lawn care business. And the reason he was going to do so was to pay things down and, and have some extra money and all that kind of stuff, all good intentions. But he, and he told me this, I'm going to, I'm going to start a lawn care business and <clears throat> said, I'm going to get little business cards and Go around, put them on the uh, front doors of people in the subdivision and so forth. And, and, and I'm thinking the whole time he's telling me this, you don't know what you're doing. Because his yard was horrible. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he'd ever met a weed eater in his life. And yet he was going to start going and doing other people's yards and making money. And I just wanted to tell him, if you pass out business cards, do not put your home address on the business card. <laughs> because you will get zero customers if people look at your house. And and it's true. We want somebody that knows what they're doing, you know, to do our yard. And same thing would be true with an auto mechanic. If you've got an auto mechanic that lives a couple doors away from you and their car is always broken down and every other day they're coming to your house and going, hey, can you give me a ride to my shop? Because um, my car is broken down again. You're going to take your car to that guy? No, you're not. 
Or like a money manager, if you meet somebody and they're, and, and they're broke and they're like, yeah, I've been going through some hard times, I lost a bunch of investments, it's not been good. By the way, I've got another investment if you're interested. Uh, no, no, right? That would be a hard no, I'm doing okay on my own. Well, listen to me. Jesus is in the life-changing business. And when we are not changed, you see, he's in the life-changing business. And when our lives are not changed, when they're not any better than they were, when we're not doing the things that he wants us to do, then we're not helping with his cause. Uh, let me go out of 1 Peter for just a second. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. The apostle Paul says, we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So we are his representatives. We are his ambassadors as though God were, was drawing people to him through our lives. In other words, people are watching us. We need to be doing the right thing. Now to 1 Peter, beginning verse 8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do the right thing, he's saying, he's saying here. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, do the right thing. Bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. In other words, do the right thing. Let him turn away from evil and do the right thing. Let him seek peace and pursue peace. For the eyes of the Lord are on the person who does the right thing. One who seeks after righteousness here. And his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do the wrong thing. Now, who is there to harm you if you're zealous for doing the right thing? But am I overcooking it yet? Are you getting it? But even if you should suffer for doing the right thing, you will be blessed, have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Okay, I want to go back one verse to verse 14 where it says, if you should suffer for doing the right thing, have no fear. Have no fear. So have no fear here means to put to flight. So run away. You're running away. By the way, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1 says, the wicked flee when no one is pursuing. The righteous are as bold as a lion. Guilt is the thing that keeps us running. You're always thinking, man, you know, if I get too close to people, they're going to know me. They're going to know me. They're going to know what I'm up, up to in my life. And, and, and so we keep running. How many of you... By a show of hands, all of our campuses, how many of you, when you're driving down the road and you see a police officer, you automatically pump the brakes? <laughs> what is that? What is that? What is that? It's because we have a guilty conscience, because, because maybe a little while before that we were like doing 90, you know? and, and uh, <laughs> And so we know that we've been up to no good, and so we have that guilty conscience. And the point here is this. If you're doing the right thing, you don't have to run. You don't have to run. And wow, even as I say that, uh, maybe somebody in church today is running. You're running in your life. Can I tell you something? That's a miserable way to live. It's a miserable way to live. So what do you do? If, if that's how you're spending your life, you know, afraid to get around people, afraid to be in close context, and afraid to be in a close relationship with anybody outside of your circle, what is that? What should you do about that thing inside of you? Here's what you should do. If you're up to no good, like if you've been doing the wrong thing, you do what the Bible says. You repent. You turn away from that sin, whatever it is, and you go to Christ. You uh, confess what you've done to him. And if you've never put your faith in him as Lord and Savior, that's the first thing you do. Repent of your sins, turn from your sins, turn to Jesus Christ. If you are a follower of Christ and you've been up to no good, you too repent and you confess it to Jesus. And guess what? He has promised that he will forgive you. But then you move from that point on doing the right thing. And uh, Peter says, if you do the right thing, God will bless you, especially if you suffer because of it. Now on to verse 15 again. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Let me say something about this real quick. 
I think the reason that people end up doing the wrong thing is because they believe the wrong thing. They quit believing the right thing. What's the right thing? That Christ is Lord and he's holy. And a lot of people forget that. And a lot of people forget that he is the one who has promised to provide for our needs in this life. And so when we feel like Jesus isn't coming through, sometimes we circumvent his authority and go try to get it on our own in ways that he didn't want us to get it, which would be a sin as well. And so when we end up doing the wrong thing, it's because we're not believing the right thing, that Christ is Lord and that he is holy. If we remember that, then hopefully we'll end up doing the right thing and our lives will draw others close to him. That's number one, do the right thing. Secondly, we represent Jesus best when we answer questions with gentleness and respect. When we answer questions with gentleness and respect, if you've ever been in a store and someone who worked there was rude to you or made you feel like an idiot for asking a question, I know something about you. You came away from that store not only with negative feelings about that person, but you came away from that store with negative feelings about the whole store. And negative, if it's a franchise, about the whole franchise nationwide. You know, and around the earth, uh, you have a bad attitude now, a bad feeling, a negative vibes about that establishment, whatever it is, based on the experience that you had with one single employee who may have been having a bad day for whatever reason. Well, okay, this is where it gets scary. If you're a Christian, again, you're a representative for Jesus Christ. Back to the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 5.20. We, we are his ambassadors God makes his appeal, his appeal to others through us. That's that's an amazing thought right there. Back to the text, starting again, verse uh, 15, the whole thing this time. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense. Other translations here say to give an answer. So always prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do this with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing the right thing, if that should be God's will, than for doing the wrong thing, than for doing evil. So as Christians, we're supposed to be ready with an answer. And I want you to listen to me real close right now because this is where a lot of Christians bail. They think, well, I don't know all the answers. I'm not a theologian. I haven't been to Bible college. I don't even read my Bible every day. I don't know things, okay? And I'm afraid that somebody's going to ask me questions. And so they shy away from situations, from conversations, from even relationships for fear that someone may ask them a question about the Lord, about the Bible, a theological question that they don't know what the answer is. And so they shy away from those situations. Even before they're asked the questions, they, their fear puts them to flight. Listen, I've been, I've been doing this a long time. And um, I, I, I try to study my, study my Bible, read my Bible every day, study most days. Uh, trying to figure things out, trying to, trying to get ready for sermons and all that. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. You're never going to have all the answers. You're never going to have all the answers. Not here on this earth. So when someone asks you a question about the faith, about the Lord, about the Bible, and you don't know the answer. I'm going to show you the answer that you can give to that person that works, okay? I'm gonna put it up on the screen, and you might wanna write it down because it works, okay? (laughs) I don't know, I don't know. Probably a better answer would be this. I don't know but let me do some research and I'll get back with you because I would love to continue this conversation, okay? So what Peter is saying here in the text, 
Be prepared, be prepared with an answer. He's not saying that we have to have all the answers. Again, there are questions that we will not know until we get to heaven someday. Do you know that? Questions that we're not supposed to know the answers to. And someday when we walk through the pearly gates, we're gonna go, oh, okay. You know, because all of a sudden, we're gonna know all the answers that we did not know here on this earth. That's gonna be a, a fun day uh, to say the least. But Peter isn't saying here in the text, be a theologian. He's not saying memorize the entire Bible and know exactly what it means. He's not saying be a know-it-all. Look at verse 15 again. He's saying, be prepared to make a defense or give an answer to anyone who asks you this question for a reason for the hope that is in you. That's what we're supposed to be prepared with an answer for. When somebody says, why are you a Christian? Why do you have your faith in God? Why do you put your faith in Jesus? Why do you go to church? Why do you try to, to live the Christian life? Guess what? If you are a follower of Jesus Christ today, you have an answer. You already have an answer. There's some reason behind in your life that you made the decision to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And it could be as simple as this. I was lost. I was, uh, my life was caught up in sin. I was doing stupid things and I hurt people who were close to me and uh, I was aimless and not happy, no joy, no satisfaction. And then somebody invited me to church or I had a friend talk to me about the Lord. I heard about Jesus and what he did for me. I put my faith in him and now I know I am forgiven. I am cleansed. I have a purpose in my life. My life has meaning and I love that God is now working through me and I'm so glad that I can be talking to you right now. You know, just some answer like that. It can be that short and sweet. Now you can give more details in the beginning if that helps to identify with the person that you're talking to. But all of us who follow Jesus, we already have a reason for the hope that we have in Christ. And that's what Peter says, get that, get that answer ready. Get that answer ready to share. And then he tells us how we share it is important. So he says, share it with gentleness and, and respect. Meaning, you don't talk down to the person asking you a question, even if they have a smirk on their face the entire time that you're answering. They don't even know it yet, but what's happening by them even asking the question is that the Holy Spirit is reeling them closer and closer to Jesus. That's what he's doing, bringing them closer in their heart. By the way, one of the many people that we've been praying for, the campus pastors and I, uh, for the past 84, I think, days now, is uh, someone who asked for prayer for a friend who doesn't believe in God. So they're asking for prayer for this friend that doesn't believe in God, but then they said something like this. They said, even though my friend doesn't believe in God, every time we get together, we end up talking about God. That, my friends, is God, right? That's God's Holy Spirit drawing that person closer and closer and closer to Jesus. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit is the, is the one who draws people to Jesus, but he might draw them through you to get there. So how do you treat them when you're answering their questions? How do you answer? You answer with gentleness and respect. I love the way that Billy Graham said it years ago. He said, I'm a beggar telling other beggars where I found bread. And if we can just have that attitude, that approach, that no matter how tough the questions get or how far from God the person is that we're engaging with, that they are, they are made in God's image. And once upon a time, we were lost as well. And, and yet we found hope in Jesus Christ. If we can just treat them like, like, like we would want to be treated in their situation, I believe that it's only a matter of time before they join Team Jesus. Representing Jesus well by telling your story of faith with gentleness and respect represents Jesus well. And then thirdly, we represent Jesus best when we keep our hope no matter what. No matter what happens in this crazy, insane world that we live in, when we keep our hope no matter what. Now, it's not surprising that uh, God would have Peter mentioned suffering here in the text again. He's done it several times throughout the, throughout the letter. 
But because he mentions it again, um, I'm just going to make a note of it here. These people, if you've been with us, you already know this. These people were about to undergo terrible persecution. They didn't even know it yet. But as we said, I don't remember which week. No, I'm sorry. Maybe week one. If our faith is real, then when tested, it will remain. And in fact, not only will our faith remain, but our faith grows stronger when tested. Peter again points the folks and us to Jesus as our example, reminding us of what he did to atone for our sins, his death, his burial, his resurrection, so that we could be in a relationship with Almighty God. And then verse 18 says this. He says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous and for the unrighteous. Let's stop right here because I don't want you to miss this phrase right here. If you read it fast, you can read it wrong. Here's, I'll read it fast, watch. For Christ also suffered once for sins for the, un, for the righteous and for the unrighteous. That's not what it says. It says Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous, meaning Jesus, for the unrighteous, meaning us, okay? Let me read it again with that in mind now. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous suffered for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Okay, this may be one of those sections of scriptures where you say, I don't know, okay? And that would be appropriate. So what in the world is he talking about here? He's talking about the Spirit of Christ proclaimed or preached uh, during the days of Noah uh, before the flood. I'm, I'm going to condense a whole lot of reading and a number of commentaries into what I believe is the best guess. I would like to say answer, but it's still a guess, right? We don't know for sure, uh, but he, he references the Spirit of Christ here. And, and this is not the first time that he's done this in this letter. He also references the Spirit of Christ back in chapter 1, where he was talking about the Old Testament prophets and the Spirit of Christ prophesying through them. So, Spirit of Christ being in them, prophesying through them. In fact, let's just go back to chapter 1 and uh, verse 10 and 11. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So Peter says, the Spirit of Christ was in the Old Testament prophets, prophesying through them. And now here we are in chapter 3, and he says the Spirit of Christ proclaimed or preached back during the days of Noah, while Noah was building the ark. So, how, uh, so could it be that what he's saying here is that the Spirit of Christ was preaching through Noah as Noah was building the ark? I, I don't know for sure, but I'm thinking maybe Noah had a crowd every day. Like he's building a very large boat in his yard. So people are probably showing up going, what, what, hey, brother, what we got going on here? We just, boats are getting pretty large here, and we do have an HOA. And um, <laughs> what are you up to, brother? What are you up to? And, and Noah gets to tell him what he's up to, Spirit of Christ speaking through him. And then the giraffes show up. And then people are like, well, giraffes, really? Really? Okay. You know, we're limited to a cat and a dog here in the subdivision, and you got giraffes. And, and so every day, maybe, maybe people just showing up to make fun of him, he was able to tell them why he was putting his hope in what God had said. For 50 to 120 years, he was able to preach. And in the end, only his family was saved. And I'm going to leave it at that because that's where the flood waters get muddy. Okay, but speaking of water, in chapter three, this is we're back to where we began. Okay, in chapter three, he talks about this idea of salvation through the water. That's the image here: salvation through the water, and he he tells us that that corresponds with baptism. He says these two, the flood waters of Noah. And baptism correspond. Let me, let me put these verses together. This is verse 20. I'm not going to stop, and I'm just going to go to 21, all right? 
Uh, God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with the angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So first of all, uh, it says the saving part of baptism here is not the physical act. It's not the removal of dirt from the body. So he's saying it's not the physical act of baptism that would save a person. Uh, otherwise, we could just baptize people that didn't want to be baptized, and they would then be Christ followers, right? Which would be awesome. It would be so much fun. We could just tell, you can tell your friends, we're going to have a, a big thing at church. A big pool party, come. And they went, no, and then we, uh, and then people, <laughs> and then everybody would leave Christians, and it would be awesome. And we'd live happily ever after. But that doesn't work. It doesn't work. He says it's, it's not a physical act that saves us. He says it saves us as an appeal to God, meaning an earnestly seeking, intense desire or response to God. The Amplified version of the Bible uh, really draws this out. It says that baptism is a response to God. So baptism is us responding to God. It's us saying yes. It's us saying yes for what God has done for us and what he's offered to us. The yes happens here first in our hearts. Happens here. But it is evidence for the world to see in the act of baptism. And with that said, anybody here at church today who has said yes here but has not been baptized, you can as you maybe have heard during announcements at your campus, you can do that today. Baptism, if you don't know, is a picture of the death, the burial, and the what of Jesus? The resurrection of Jesus, who has won the battle. And he's gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with the angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So here you go, folks. We can have hope no matter what. Because Jesus won. He won. He won. And so he's going to keep a hold of us no matter what happens in this world. You know, the world was so bad during the days of Noah. And I believe it's chapter 6 where it says that uh, God was so fed up with the, with the way the world was. He says that the world was full of violence. Violence which the uh, Hebrew word for violence there is the word Hamas. Hamas. Don't believe me? Look it up, okay? And, and so God said, we're just going to start over. And he wiped the earth clean. Over in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the second coming. Like when I come back again, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. Now here we are in a world full of violence in a world gone mad where everything's turned upside down. And again, it may feel like the correct response would be to run for the hills. But what's God want? He wants us to keep our hope in him no matter what comes next and no matter how bad it gets. Campus pastors, I want you to come to the stage at this time. They're gonna close the service for us in just a moment. Let me say one more thing to you before I let you go. We talk about this on a semi-regular basis at our church that the, the way that God tends to operate is he puts somebody in our lives that needs him, somebody that doesn't know Christ. We call that person our one. And I'm praying, I'm praying that that person that God has placed in all of our lives, when they look at us this week, that they'll be able to see Jesus in us. Amen? Love you guys. We'll see you next time.